Uh, okay, so the first thing I would like to do, if uh, we're going to bounce around a little bit here, so just stick with me. Um, we are going to go to session 10 from our class, and inside session 10, there is that puppet warp folder, and inside that is just the regular puppet warp figure, although hang on one second, I think this is the wrong one. Yeah, that's the wrong one. Hang on one second. We um, This is the same exact thing happened to us last week when we were looking at different ones. Go to your session 9 instead. So inside of session 9 in, in the uh, build background exercise, there's another version of that puppet warp file in there that's just cleaner. So again, if you take a look at my screen really quickly, it's in session nine inside the folder called build background exercise. And inside that is a file that's called puppet warp with figure or something like that. So it was one thing that I didn't show you uh, in puppet warp that I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of. <clears throat> it's just another um, thing to be happy about um, uh, 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 the selection process and the ability to knock things out that we've actually done in this class. So, <coughs> sorry, if you scroll to the top, there is a group called Figure. Go ahead and select that group and then turn the eyeball off for background. So it's again, it's basically just the girl on a, a transparent background. And then we are going to turn the entire, everything that's inside this figure group, we're gonna turn that all into one smart object. So with the figure group selected, you don't have to open it up, you don't have to close it, just make sure that everything is showing. Uh, come up to the, I'm sorry, the uh, layer menu down to smart objects and over to convert to smart object. And this now makes this a smart object. And again, if we go up to the edit menu and say puppet warp and click on the show mesh, you'll see that the mesh is all over the girl, but it's nowhere else. And this allows us to do all the things we did. So for instance, if we wanted to, I'm just gonna hit some points. You don't need to do this, but it allows us to move the arms. It allows us to move the legs, make her taller, shorter, all the kinds of, it allows us to do all of that stuff. So if you've done all that, actually click, if you came in here in Puppet Warp with me, hit the circle at the top in the options bar, the circle with a slash through it to jump out of that. If instead we go back in history to when this thing was just opened up, and so I'm just gonna click on the, the this history state of the Puppet Warp when it opens, the background is now visible, and instead of actually just uh, clicking on the figure group, uh, and turning it into a smart object, I'm going to do something different. I'm going to select the figure group, and then I want to do a merge stamp of everything. So I want to add the background to this figure. So again, to do a merge stamp, remember, wherever you do your merge stamp, the merge is going to happen right above whatever layer you've got selected. So right now, I want it to be on the very top of my layer stack. But if I was down here and I'd clicked on background and I did my merge stamp version, it would still do the same thing. It would merge the girl and to the background and all that, but it would end up being right here on top of uh, the background underneath the girl. And that's not what I want to do. So again, I'm just make sure that the background is visible, that white background, the figure is selected. Hold down command, option, shift and the letter E. Again, for Windows people, it would be control, option, shift, and the letter E. And you'll see it makes a merge stamp version that's sitting now on the very top. We're gonna turn this into a smart object. So up to the layer menu, down to smart objects, over to convert to smart object. And then we're gonna puppet warp this. So again, up to the edit menu, down to puppet warp, and look what happens if you show your mesh. It now wants to warp the entire image, all of it. And so there is no way that you can control this now. Again, if you try to do that same trick, I'm going to go ahead and pin down her arms <clears throat> and her legs and her body. But now I'm going to click on that arm and try to move it. And again, she's attached to the background. So the background just completely distorts this and pulls in. There's no way to avoid this. None way. So it really inherits that whole puppet metaphor. If you think about a puppet on a string, it's completely void for, or devoid from its background. 
So uh, again, I just wanted to make sure everybody was uh, um, uh, understood that one. We can get out of this guy. We don't need to save it. You don't need to do any work. That was just something I wanted to check off the list. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is recoloring. This is something that's really, really, really critical. And I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> the recipe that I use to actually do this work goes way, way, way back. I already told you this once. I have this book. It was called the Photoshop Cookbook, I think, or something like that. It was uh, written in Photoshop when Photoshop 6 was around, and I'm not talking about CS6. I'm talking about Photoshop 6, which was in the somewhere in the early 90s. Um, you can't buy this book anymore. You can't. I've looked for it. You can't find it anywhere. So, but at any rate, um, so if you go to also into our session 10 files. Um, and you take a look inside there, you will see that there is uh, a couple of PDFs. One of them is recoloring uh, fabric. If you click on that and open it up, it has two recipes for you in here, and we're going to actually do both of them right now. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna go, whenever I do this work, guys, I don't bother to memorize this stuff. I know it pretty well but typically I will simply go to my recipe and I'll open this thing up. So again, yet another thing for you to end up saving. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, you should got just put somewhere on in, in, in your digital life, build a folder, a folder that's just sort of like retouching techniques or retouching PDFs or whatever, and just throw everything that I've ever given to you in this class in there so that when you come along and you actually have to do something like this, you know, you're not scrambling to try to find videos and you're not ailing, ailing me saying, could you send that to me? But anyway, uh, so anyway, I just wanted you to know that part. That's what we're going to follow. There are also um, <clears throat> three files that are marked shirts. So there is a shirt dark version two, a shirt light version two, and then a shirt midtone. The one I want you to open up is the shirt dark version two. If you could go ahead and open this guy up. So our goal in all of this is to make this a white shirt. Again, I'm trying to do the most extremes here. I'm also going to show you how to recolor a shirt, but that's gonna be the goal that we go after uh, in doing this one. And it's really funny. I had I said this to somebody one time before. I was like, so how can, I, can you make that a white shirt? And they just did this. They go, yep. They just inverted it and said, it's white shirt. Um, it's clearly a negative, so that's not really going to work for us here, but um, I, it was clever. So anyway, uh, we're going to talk about how to actually really do this guy. So the first thing to do in this, and this is the single most important thing, it's part of the, I'm, I'm going to go circling all the way back to our very first class, when we actually changed the color of the Corvette. The way it worked for me, the way I could do it so fast was is that I had converted the file from an RGB file into an LAB file. And that's critical because in an LAB world, you separate color from luminosity. And so when you change the color, you do not change the luminosity. That's not something you can do in RGB. In an RGB world, when you change R or G or B or all of them, it doesn't matter. You shift the color, but they are directly connected to luminosity and you shift the tone as well. So for instance, if you were to drag uh, the R channel of an RGB image down to make it less red, you would also make it darker. And that really screws things up, especially when you're dealing with things like shadows and, and that sort of thing in here. So um, our first move in this is to convert this to an LAB file. To do that, come up to the image menu, down to mode, down to LAB. So take a look at my screen and see where I'm at. Image to mode, down to LAB and let go. And you won't notice any change at all. I mean, it should look exactly the same, but if you look over in your channels palette, you will see you no longer have RGB at the top and you no longer have an R or a, B, a G or a B uh, channel. You've now got an LAB composite that's sitting up at the top. You've got a lightness channel, you've got an A channel, and you've got a B channel. And then you've also got a couple of channels that I've made for you. So the shirt and the labels and the buttons, those are all um, um, uh, selections that I've pre-made for you guys just to save time here. So anyway, that is your first move and always your first move. And the more radical your color corrections are, the more important this step is. 
Um, so do not, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, don't skip that one. You'll uh, uh, actually regret it. Uh, <coughs> okay, we've done that part. I'm going to just check my mask right here. We've done that part. So if you click on the shirt uh, alpha channel that's just in here, all this is is I made a mask uh, that will allow me to change the color of the shirt. Remember, uh, where you have white on a mask, it reveals. Where you have black on it, it conceals. So this mask right now is going to allow me to, when I use it, it's going to allow me to change the color of the shirt, but it's going to protect the color of the buttons, the color of the labels, and the color of the background. And that's really critical to us because when you do this kind of work, oftentimes you're trying to strictly change the color of the fabric. and Things like buttons and labels and backgrounds, that kind of th those sorts of things uh, remain consistent. And so the easiest way is to simply do it like this. So then we're going to come over to our layers palette and we are going to create an empty group. So if you simply click on at the very bottom of your layers palette, there's an icon down there that looks like a file folder. A folder? Fi a, fi a, fo a file? Looks like a folder. Uh, click on that guy and it'll actually add up on very top of your image uh, uh, a thing called group one and I'm actually going to uh, change the name of that group and I'm going to call it a uh, white shirt and say okay to that then we are going to load the um, uh, uh, shirt mask so I'm going to hover over my channels palette again do not select that channel layer just hover over the thumbnail hold down the control or the command key and click on it to load it as a selection and then come back over to your layers palette on the white shirt and simply click on the icon at the bottom of your layers palette the circle i'm sorry the rectangle with the, uh, the light rectangle the dark circle in the middle to add a layer mask you can mask groups so this is just now i don't have anything in the group right now but i'm putting a mask on that and the reason i do this is that I'm going to use multiple layers inside the group and instead of masking or using the same mask for every single one of them or getting into clipping for all of them, it's just easier to put the layer mask on the group and that way I don't need to worry about it. Um, Okie dokie. Come back down to your background layer and select that and then we're going to make just a copy of my background layer. again. I always keep a virgin. I'm never going to change that part. So all the work that I'm going to do, I'm going to start at least with one copy of this. So Command J will make a copy of it. And then you need to rename that from background copy to, I'm going to call it DSAT1. It stands for a desaturated layer number one. And then we need to desaturate this guy. This is another really critical step that you do when you're doing color correction. It's much easier to start with no color and add color than it is to start with a color that you have to modify, right? So I'm going to start now. This image, I doubt that there's really any color in here. If you actually hover over the black and take a look at it, I'm looking at my RGB readouts and for the most part, they're all consistent, but it wouldn't matter. If this thing was just a dark purple shirt or a dark maroon shirt or a dark green shirt or what, anything, it wouldn't matter you would still do the same trick. So up to the image menu, down to adjustments, down to desaturate. So a lot of people use that very same method we just did to make black and white. That is not a very smart move. Black and white does not lose color evenly. So um, that's why the black and white adjustment layer is a much better option for doing it. But that's also why you have all those sliders in the black and white adjustment layer for individual colors. For instance, anybody in here shoot black and white film? Okay, so all you black and white, tr is Trax crowd, probably? No, what do you shoot? Uh, okay. HB5, it doesn't really matter. Even as today with modern technology, don't you struggle with your skies blowing out? And the reason it is, is that it's incredibly hard to make a film that is not more sensitive to blue than all the other colors. So, um, and so they fight that. That's all built into the way they've designed the film. Um, but anyway, that's why the, the same, that thing exists in, the, in terms of the slider controls in the black and white adjustment layer is to basically emulate that part. Because again, in, the, in, in your experience with black and white, it doesn't just take what you see in front of you and like lose the color. It's, uh, it loses it some 
are more sensitive and some are less sensitive. So at any rate, um, but this works fine for us because we're just trying to get rid of color here. So then I'm going to grab this layer and drag it on top of the group. And when the group gets its blue circle all the way around it and you let go, it puts it inside of the group. And the way you know it's inside is that it actually pushes the whole, that layer slightly over to the right. You get this uh, empty space in it. It also opens up the group. You'll notice that there's that little triangle, drop down triangle on the left side of that. If you collapse that, you'll see it's actually hidden. It sits inside of the group. So this is actually now inside of the group. So that's gonna be my first move right now. You need to then make two copies of this DSAT one. So I'm gonna hold down again, Command J will make one copy of it. And this is also inside of the group. And a second one, Command J, also inside of the group. So now I've got three layers, DSAT1, DSAT1 copy, and DSAT2 copy. I'm going to rename the first one in the middle, DSAT2, and then finally the one on top, DSAT3. This isn't as critical as it is doing stuff like split frequency, but it's just housekeeping always helps. Um, the thing that you can get seduced into believing, and I'm gonna just try to warn you away from this, is that you say to yourself, well, I'm working here, Versa, and I don't need to label this. I know exactly what it is, and I'll know exactly what it is tomorrow morning when I get up and work on it. And that's all true, but what happens when you get up and work on it in a year or five years? Ask Britta. She's going to actually go back in and start working on stuff that's a year old. And it's like, do you remember what you did? And it's, I, I, no, and that can be horrible. You're just, you're looking at it and then you're spending all this time trying to figure out what the hell it is that you did. No, anyway, so anyway. anyway. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah, good luck with that. Good luck with that. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna say turn off the eyeball for DSAT2 and for DSAT3, select DSAT1. So I've just turned off my two top DSAT layers and I've selected uh, the version uh, number one. And we are going to add a solid color adjustment layer above this. So come down to your adjustment layer. It's the circle that's half white, half black. Click on it and come up to the very top, solid color. And then the color picker that opens up I'm going to ask you to type in a values for RGB values. So if you select the little box that's right next to the R and type in 240, hit the tab key, it'll take you to the green box, type in also 240, and then finally tap in uh, a tab key again and go to the blue box and type in 240. And what it ends up being, it's just a very light gray. Um, and go ahead and say okay to that. So then in looking at this, it's like, okay, well, I accomplished this. I've made the shirt actually white now, but the shirt has absolutely no detail in it. It has no character in it. It's strictly got this. That's all there is to it. Uh, and that's actually not enough for me. So you then need to change the blending mode of this solid color layer from normal down to hard light. And when you do that, you then finally do pick up a little bit. If you take a look, it's difficult to see this on my screen up here. I can see it better on my computer, but you see a little bit on here. You pick up a little bit of the collar. You pick up a little bit of the, um, uh, of the, of the, the scene that's running down the center of the shirt. You get the cuff by the uh, elbow part, whatever. But it's horribly, 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 horribly flat. So we need to pump the contrast in this guy. So to do that, Select DSAT2, make it visible, and all of a sudden your image goes black. And then we're going to change the blending mode of this DSAT2 from normal down to overlay. Now remember, overlay is a contrast blending mode. And so what's happening here is it's actually basically taking this layer and treating it as a dodge and burn. Because remember, we've used soft light to do our dodging and burning for tonal retouching. Overlay is just a more aggressive version of soft light. It, the idea is basically the same thing. It's in the contrast group. 
So then you can look at this and you can say, oh, well, okay, that actually did a better job. Do you feel like this is enough contrast? For me, I think it could probably handle a little bit more. It still seems a little bit pale to me. So I'm gonna go up and turn on DSAT 3. I'm gonna select it and turn it on and do the same trick. I'm gonna change its blending mode from normal down to overlay. And when you take a look at this, it's like, well, okay, yeah, but now this looks like a, um, uh, a more of a, it's not a white shirt anymore. It's kind of like, it looks a little bit dirty to me. So the first thing is you could say, well, maybe we oversaturate, maybe we hit that contrast a little bit too hard. Uh, I feel that way, so I'm gonna simply drop the opacity. I'm not gonna turn the layer off. I want some of it, but I don't want all of it. So I'm just gonna grab the slider, the opacity slider in the layers palette for that second layer, I mean for that DSAT 3 layer, and I'm just going to click on the name opacity and start to drag towards the left and it'll actually drop the contrast down. And I get to the place here where I feel like, okay, well that looks like, that's a pretty good version of a white shirt. However, I feel like the contrast part's right. This is another reason that you really care about the having this in LAB is that all the shadows, like the shadow right at the collar in between the split of the shirt here, it's, it's huge to have this done here. So, but I'm still, things are not quite, it seems still like a little bit more of a gray shirt. So if you feel that way, go back down to your solid color layer, double click on it to open it up, and we're going to slightly lighten up that color. I'm going to take it from a 240, so I've just selected my R value, 240, I'm gonna make it 245, tab key 245, tab key 245. That was a 40, sorry. Uh, and say okay. Now I've made the color slightly lighter and that's a white shirt. Make sense? I know. Okay. Collapse the group and then I want you to make a duplicate of the group. So I've just collapsed the group. I've highlighted the whole group itself. Command J to simply make a copy of it. And now we're going to color the shirt. We're going to make it a different color. And so something that you guys should know about is that <clears throat> whenever you're doing retouching, you're going to get specs from this. So if you're working for a company that has like, you go to work for The Gap or for, you know, whoever, and they've got shirts like of a thousand different colors, it's all the same style shirt, but they just kind of comes in an infinite variety of colors. And so what they will end up do, doing is giving you, they won't give you RGB values for that. They won't give you CMYK values for it. They won't get, what they will ultimately give you is Pantone colors. How many people in this room have never heard of Pantone? Okay, so Pantone is the company, it's the color library. They define color for pretty much everybody in the world. Um, there are different color systems that you'll find in Europe and Asia, but even in Europe and Asia, they primarily will focus on Pantone colors. So that's just what it is. It's a company that puts out color swatches. So if you do a quick search, as a matter of fact, everybody do this really quickly, just jump online real fast and do a search for Pantone and say okay to that, and then just go to their website and look at it. This is how everybody, Pantone not only does color, but they do color forecasting. So you will see color of the year is all made by Pantone. That's who establishes all of this. They are like, it's, it's like the Bible. Um, the problem is, is that, well, not the problem, but you see these books, they look like swatch books. They look like swatch books for paint, but they are incredibly specific and incredibly expensive. One of these little swatch books right here can be $200, and they come in sets. The Pantone set that I've got right now has got three color books in them. And the reason they come in multiple books is that they use multiple different kinds of ink to do this. So for instance, there is a Pantone that is actually a glossy ink. There's a Pantone that is a matte ink. Those are two completely different books and two completely different specs. They also take into cardstock. If you actually print out the exact same ink on a matte surface, it's very different color than on a glossy surface. And so 
when you get these specs, because this is what an, every art director in the world or every production house in the world or every fashion house in the world or every car manufacturer in the world, every anybody, any Coca-Cola, any product manager, whatever, they will send you their Pantone color. And you need to match that color, but you need to know which of them it is you're trying to match. Make sense? So to figure this all out, you can, I'm gonna quit my Chrome because again, it takes up too many resources. So I've got a second white shirt thing that's actually here. I'm going to click this open and I'm gonna go down to the solid color that we've got and I'm gonna double click on this and it'll open up my color picker again and this is where I've got those things specified as 245, 245, 245. However, you will notice, and a lot of you guys may not even know that this existed, there is a button right above the LAB scale that says color libraries. If you click on that, it will actually open up. <clears throat> In the drop down menu for book, you will actually see here that, yeah, I was wondering when this was gonna happen. There was a rumor that Pantone was going to, um, that Photoshop was no longer going to pay Pantone to actually do their colors anymore. So, Hang on one second. I'm going to see when the... Wait, hang on. Did I just miss that? No, I did not. All right. Hang on one second. I'm going to go back to Photoshop version 2023 and see if I can find it. You guys do know you can download uh, previous versions of Photoshop. It doesn't cost anything. They're just the older versions. Photoshop has a way of, of uh, taking really important stuff for uh, people like us who are doing production grade work and uh, orphaning it. Aha, so you just need to go back one generation of Photoshop. So when I went back to, this is so confusing, to Adobe Photoshop 2023, which is also, if you look at the number of Photoshop, it's going to be 24. So anyway, why Adobe can't get their shit together as far as this part goes, I don't know. You do not need to do this, just follow along with me, or if you want to, if you've already got 2023 still loaded, I, got, I have four or five versions of Photoshop on mine and I simply keep going back. Um, there may be a way that you can actually buy the Pantone color set, but at any rate, I just wanna show you how this whole thing works so at least you're aware of it and that you understand that's what's going on. So I'm gonna open that very same file that I just had. Uh, into my 2023 so I'm back to where I was before I'm at the color picker I'm mean, sorry I'm at the uh, I've opened up this was my uh, uh, white shirt copy right here uh, I've got my color swatch here that I was putting in I'm going to double click on that to get to the color picker and you can see it's the 245 245 245 I'm going to click on color libraries and in the drop down menu now I actually still have Pantone colors and they're sitting here at the very bottom and even though they're listed as CMYK what we're really looking for here they give you three of them here um, the metallic colors you don't need to worry about too much because most people I mean they are colors but we don't have metallic inks inside of Photoshop and there's no really way to recreate them. You can get them, uh, printers actually have them. They, they actually, Pantone makes the ink that's got metallics in it. We don't really work with that part, but this coated, uncoated thing we do. And what you'll see on any given Pantone <laughs> color is that they will give you a spec. So one of the specs for a Pantone color could be like a 468C. And that C means it's a coated stock, or you'll see a 468U, 
which means it's an uncoated stock. It matters and you need to pay attention to that. Most of the color work that I get is actually given in a coated stock. So if we take a look at the Pantone coated stock right here, you'll see this is what the lists are. And again, they're always listed like this. So it's like a P175-5C. I mean, that's basically what's going on. You'll see that you've also got an entire color tree right here. So I'm gonna pick something that's more into the sort of like uh, uh, magentas or the pinks. So I'm gonna make a pink shirt right here. So let's say I've got a client that gives me this uh, and they say, okay, we want you to replicate the Pantone P75-3C. So you're saying to yourself, well, I've got to go through this whole chain link thing here. There's no way. Hang on one second. I got to copy this number down really fast. So it was a uh, P77. I'm sorry. Yeah. P77-2-C. So um, I'm going to start way down here in a completely different place. And they tell you, you want this color and you're like, oh my God, I got to scroll through this to find this. You actually don't. You just need to start hitting the 77 dash two and it will actually take you to it. So um, if they give you this number, simply type the number in. And mine was this 77 two C. So I'm going to click on it and it's this color right here. Again, you've got a before and after in your color picker. So it is this color right here. So that part's great. But then this is also giving to me, wow, they've screwed this up too. I used to be, oh, I take that back. I think I can still get this. Yeah, go ahead and click on the color itself to get the color picker and say okay. And then if we double click on that color patch again, yeah, this is only giving me in CMYK color here, which is pissing me off. You used to give, it used to give you the LAB values right here and you could actually then put these in, in terms of LAB. I'm going to fake this and try to put this into CMYK. We'll see how we get. So for my CMYK color values there, I've got a C of zero. Uh, I've got an M of 21. I've got uh, uh, yellow is also zero and then K is 10. So I'm going to try to recreate that part. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and say okay to that. If you take a look at the shirt right now, it actually does not look that color at all. Again, that was a light pink. So your trick is to turn off your saturation moves here to sort of see what you really need to get that same color. So I'm going to then click on this first uh, saturation because I think it needs a little bit more, but not quite as much. So I'm going to drop the opacity off this back just a little bit. And then finally, I'm going to grab my color picker. So again, the color sampler tool. And in this case, you want to sample a color that actually doesn't look um, uh, uh, um, uh, it, it doesn't have shadows and it. it doesn't have highlights in it. I'm going to just drop a spot right here in the middle. And so I get a drop down menu right here and you can see in my number one readout here, I get values of LAB. If you click on your drop down menu and you come down to CMYK readout, this is the CMYK readout and this whole uh, demo is going to hell. It used to be these colors would be in LAB because this thing is in LAB and all we had to do was tweak the LAB colors but there is no way I'm going to be able to tweak this CMYK color using an LAB curve. So I will figure this one out and we will look at this one next time we all get together and I'll see if there's a way that we can actually get back to it. It's unfortunate that they've actually done this part, but here, let me see if I can get to this. You just what? Yeah, right? Especially mine. Let me just see what this LAB value is. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna go there. Okay. So, sorry, but at the very least, you figured out how you can actually shift and change color. So, blah, 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 blah. Um, for the work that you guys are doing, it's not going to be this production specific. So, this is how you would actually change and make completely different. And the advantage now is, is that with this, if you double click, and you guys can do this on the version of Photoshop that you actually have, um, we could... Um, uh, simply double click on this and pick any other color. You don't need to be in the library. We can go back to our regular uh, normal. 
Oh, wait a second. I do have it. I lied. Okay, almost done. Back to the color picker. What did I say that color was? It is 77. Oh, sorry, not in the Pantone. So again, it was a coated stock, 77. And it was the 77.2. So I'm going to go ahead and say this. And then I'm going to click on picker, I think. Yes, and I have LED values right here. So this color now has, we're done. We're actually recovered. So it has an L value of 81. It has an A value of 15. And this is important. It's got a B value of a negative three. So LAB does not work the typical way RGB or CMYK. Well, CMYK works in percentages. LAB works on a scale of zero to 255. What, uh, I'm sorry, RGB works on a scale of zero to 255. What LAB does is that it actually puts a neutral right in the middle. So you have LAB sits at zero, or, or the color would sit at zero, and then as you start, so if we're gonna do the, uh, let's do the B channel, which is the blue to yellow channel. If you're doing the B part, it's actually positive zero to plus 128. If you're doing the yellow part, it's negative. It's zero to negative 127. And then the same thing happens. So these negative values matter right here. So I've just copied down what these LAB values should be. I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to that. I'm gonna turn on my DSAT one to bring in a little bit of contrast, but I know that this is not the real color here. Again, if I have my, my color picker right here and I've got my readout right here, I can see that, nope, this is not going to be the exact same numbers. So I'm gonna add a color correction curve on top of this. It's just a regular curve. So I'm gonna add a curve, but unlike RGB, we don't have RGB values right now. We have the LAB values. So we have a lightness channel, an A channel, and a B channel. But I have the values written down. So my L channel was supposed to be an 81. So if you grab the targeting adjustment tool here, the hand that's got the arrow pointing up and down, and you hover over that color sampler spot and you click and drag up, I'm just watching the readout up in my info palette. I need an L of 81. And then I'm gonna go to my A channel. Again, A is the axis from green to magenta or green to red. Some people call it that way. Hover over the same thing. The value that I'm looking for was a 15. It's at a 14 right now. So I'm gonna click and go up just one. Use my arrow key to come back down. I've now got a 15. And then finally the B channel to do the exact same thing. And I'm going to click and it's supposed to be a minus three. So I'm going to pull down or I'm going to pull up one. Go to my arrow key and pull up one. This is now a perfect matched LAB version of that Pantone color. And you can do this all day long. Right? Oh, we've got a hundred shirts. Versa what would 100 shirts cost me to be photographed? And I would say, how would you guys bill that out? How would you do an estimate for 100 shirts? I got 100 copies of this very same shirt. It's just 100 different colors, same style shirt. We want that all shot. What would you charge? Okay, well, so then let's just figure this out, right? So the truth of it is when you're doing shirts like this, you've got to hire a stylist and a stylist assistant because number one, you need the shirt prepped and that's the stylist assistant job, but then it needs to be folded. So they have boards that you actually use to fold these shirts. So they're fold, if anybody's worked in retail, they use the same thing there. But it's a board that you put, uh, that you lay the shirt down, you put the board on top of it, and then you start folding around it. But it gets really, really, really hyper-specific. And then once you get it all pinned out, uh, once you get it all done, you have to then flip it over and you put it onto a, what they call a pin board. So it's just a piece of foam core that is, uh, it's slanted so they'll put it against a wall like this so it's slanted against the wall they'll pin this again so that in, so that a photographer can attack it straight on easily as opposed to having it flat where a camera actually has to be on top of this and come down nobody likes to work like that so they anyway they slant these things whatever so that's basically what is involved in all of this so let's figure this out let's say we're going to be really optimistic and really crank we can do 20 of those in a day because it takes for fucking ever to act steam these things, iron them, 
All the creases need to be creased, all the all of that kind of stuff. That's what needs to be done, right? The labels need to be uncurled. They probably need to be stuck down. I mean, it's that kind of work. Um, so I can do 20 a day, five days of work. All right, I'm gonna give you my Chicago rate, not my New York rate. My Chicago rate to do this kind of work, because this is gonna be for some catalog. This is not national advertising. Anybody who's doing these color swatches, this is more catalog, e-com, that kind of work. $2,500 a day. So I'm at $2,500 a day. That's, I'm gonna figure out what the full day rate would this, this would actually be. Styling assistant, 300, so now I'm at 28. Stylist itself, 750. Let's make the math easy. I'm gonna round it up to eight. So eight, so now I'm at 36, right? $3,600 a day, right? But I need an assistant. That's another $300 a day. So now I'm at 39. I need a digital tech. So that's a 500. So now I'm at 44. I need a studio. That's a thousand a day. So now I'm at 54. And that doesn't count lunch. That doesn't count that, that doesn't count anything. So let's just make the math easy. I'm going to round it up to six grand a day. That's basically what it's going to cost me to do that. Five days, 30 grand. Client comes back to me and says, and this will always happen. You know, they'll say, this is what it's going to be. I can do 20 a day. It's going to take me five days, 30 grand. And they go, wow, that seems really high. Can you knock that down? Typical negotiation 101. Sure. How much do you need? I need you to knock 20% off of that. How about 10? Okay, let's knock 10 off, right? So now instead of 30 grand, I'm at $27,000 to do this, right? And they say, oh, come on, man, you're killing me here. I really can't, you take off that other 10%. And I'm finally like, you'll never get anything else out of it, but I'll be like, okay, you promised me that I do this for the next five years. I get this same job for the next five years, whatever. I'll knock it out. So we'll be at 25,000. And they go, great, Bursar, I love you. Yep, here's the work. We'll ship the shirts out to you, blah, 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 and I go, get okay, great. So I get the studio, and I get the stylist assistant, and I get the stylist, whatever, and we, we basically prep one shirt. Takes me half a day. So my half a day, I'm still going to charge the 2500 for the, I'm still going to charge the whole six grand for the day. I'm not going to cheap out on a stylist assistant and say, well, it's only half a day. I'm only going to give you $150. That's a way to lose talent, right? That's a way to, well, get a bad name. Don't work for that guy. He's a cheap asshole, right? The hell would that work? You definitely want it for that guy. He, he booked me for the day. It took us two hours, right? So I get him to do two hours of work, and then I don't even do this work. I hand this off to my digital tech, and it takes him three hours, two hours to bang out the rest of it. So I've got a $6,000 cost. 2500 of it is, which is my profit, right? And then I bill $25,000. They get it and they're like, my God, this is insane. The colors are perfect. Every, you know, you take your time to make that one really, really good. You know, God, look at how beautifully that style. It's just incredible. Why they even trimmed the little threads by the buttonholes. That's just insane. This looks amazing. All right. <laughs> Uh, okay, are there any questions about any of this? Are we good? All right, there's another recipe. It's slightly different to actually do the white shirt to black. I'm not going to bother with that. You've got the recipe right there. It's a little bit simpler. Um, uh, and then doing the, actually the middle shirt is done exactly the same way as this one, the middle tone shirt. Okay, you can close this up. You don't need to save this. Uh, next file is going to be in that same session 10 folder. <laughs> and there's a folder inside of that called Moray. So M-O-I-R-E, it's a French word. And it, anyway, that's what it is. There's a thing in there, it's called Moray Photos. Inside of this, there's also um, two PDFs. One is Moray Removal, it's how pretty much everybody does it. There's another version for <coughs> heavy duty Moray. It's really, 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 it's a complicated thing. It doesn't really work all of that well, um, but we need to talk about what Moray really is um, and then how to get rid of it. So inside that very same folder is another file called colormoraryremoval.tiff, if you could open that up. 
And then there's another file that I want you to also open up as well, and it's one that's just regularly called moray.jpg. If you can open that up, hopefully in Photoshop as well, just so that we can see both of these guys. Okay. So if we take a look at the first one, it's a, um, uh, it's a girl in a gray jacket, whatever here, and you can see this pattern that's actually on this. So how many people have never heard of Moray? Okay, uh, really quickly, go online again. And type in Moray. You don't need to put in the accent. O-I-R-E. And it's okay. And then just click on images and you'll see uh, 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 more images or basically uh, what's sort of happening here. You'll spot it in all of these different versions of it. But this is what causes more. Actually, if you go to the video part of this, um, or go to Wikipedia has really good more videos. So let's do wiki yeah you can see it right here so let me see if I can get a bigger version of this so what happens with moray is if you imagine the classic of this you can see it if you imagine a window screen it's basically a grid of horizontal and vertical lines uh, and by itself it just looks like a window screen but if you take a second version of that window screen and you overlay it on the first those series of lines end up hooking up and connecting into recognizable patterns if you move the screen back and forth you will actually get you'll see this shift and this is a perfect example so this is instead of it being a, a typical screen this is just two sets of circles and as they are crossing one another they're interacting with one another and you see it develops these weird other patterns that happen in here that is moray and it is a nightmare so moray is not necessarily a problem per se in shooting film but it's awful in digital moray became really 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 bad in digital and the reason it's so bad in digital is this if you take clothing which has got lines in it and the for again you fashion shooters you really need to think about this part you always need to be on the lookout. There's two things that are notorious that will moray. One of them is tweeds, and the other is any synthetic fabric that's like, uh, again, a synthetic like rayon or nylon, that kind of stuff. And the reason those become problematic is, is that because they're synthetic, um, the, the, the actual thread that makes up that fabric is identical. It's, it's, it, it never varies in size at all. It's all perfectly identical. Uh, and that's a problem. So what ends up happening is, is that, so the fabric is one of your grids, the fabric is one of your screens, but then the sensor lines on your camera are the other screen. And so when you take that fabric that's got those lines on it and you put it together with your sensor that also has lines on it, you end up with moray. The problem with this is, though, is that when most people shoot, so when you shoot tethered, a lot of you guys are shooting tethered and Capture One, what you're looking at on your screen is not a hundred percent view of your image so when you're looking at the preview you can actually get more ray so if you take a look at the uh, image that I actually ask you to open oh shit you can also run multiple versions of Photoshop at the same time but that's a way to really stretch your uh, resources thick uh, anyway, <clears throat> this is actually a screen resolution. So um, the screen resolution to make it really fast in Capture One, it um, downsamples the image. It doesn't show you the full image uh, at 100%. It shows you the. I ended up with moray here, but there was no moray in my final picture. This was because the screen resolution, the downsampled part, 
actually then matched in scale to the fabric of this jacket and I got more ray. But once we developed this file out, we didn't have any more ray in it at all. Again, you're changing. So here's the trick about trying to deal with this. There's all sorts of filters. People will sell you, it's all more, it's like snake oil about shit to get rid of more ray. The thing that you need to do is you need to number one, be aware of it. Number two, be worried about it. Number three, look for it. So if you go into Photoshop and you're doing anything that you, I mean, uh, Capture One, anything that you suspect would have more ray as you're shooting, <clears throat> you need to actually then either develop the file out completely or at least enlarge it to 100% in your preview. And then if you have it there, great. If you don't, I mean, if you don't have it there, great, you're good to go. If you have it there, there's things that we can do to actually fix that. However, so that's the thing that, that can really trip you up is that when you get a preview and because the preview again is a different screen that you're looking through uh, uh, relative, uh, in combination with the fabric is it doesn't necessarily show up in your preview but it will be in your final file and you will hate your life when that happens so you never saw it when you were shooting tethered but the minute you develop your first file you've got more ray this is there's two kinds of moray there is color moray and then there's luminosity moray this is a luminosity moray right here you know how you get rid of this you go in with the clone stamp tool and you individually clone out every one of those shadow lines one at a time it takes forever this is weeks of work and my god if you've got three or four five you just don't want to do it so how do you avoid shooting more ray? Everybody should write this down right now because this will happen to all of you. <clears throat> okay. Your first move when you spot it, your first move is to stop down your camera lens as far as you can possibly get it down. Raise up your ISO and start stopping down. So typically I'm a shooter, my always go to in shooting fashion is F8 at 100 ISO. So if I spot more ray, I head immediately to F16. I don't typically go to 22 if I don't have to, but I'll go to F16. So in stops different, what is different between? How much did I just lose when I went from F8 to F16 in stops? Two stops, can you count them out for me? Exactly, so I've lost two stops. That was at 100 ISO, how do I balance that out? I go, count it out. Exactly, so I stop down two stops in my aperture, I raise my ISO by two stops. So I don't have to relight, I don't do anything, I'm just changing that, right? But that will do go a huge way to eliminating more ray. The unfortunate part about that is the way it's doing it is you're introducing diffraction into your lens, which is softening. So you're softening up these lines, they're not as sharp as they are, and so it really suppresses the more ray. That's the first way to go about it. The second way to go about it is, let's say that this is going to be your final shot right here. This is the final cropping for this part right here. You actually take your camera and you go full length. Because what you're doing is, when you go full length, is you're changing the size. You are making the size. Because what happens here with this moray is that the lines of the fabric are incredibly close to the lines of your sensor. So if you can disrupt that scale, if you can make the lines of your fabric either larger or smaller, you can disrupt part of what causes this moray. So if I step way back and shoot this thing full length, all of the lines, all the pieces of fabric are much smaller on my sensor. So I've disrupted that relationship of size and then I simply have to crop in to actually get this scale of my image. In most cases, you have to do both. And that's what you do when you've actually are faced with uh, a, a luminosity moray, which is what this is. There's a second kind, and the second kind is actually color moray, and that one we can fix. So, questions about any of this? All right, you can close this up, and let's look at the girl in the bathing suit. 
If you zoom into her boob on the left, you'll see exactly what color more is all about and the problem you have. Can you see that whole rainbow effect right there? It's not only a rainbow effect, it's actually a circle around here. You pick it up in other places as well. <clears throat> if you really pay attention and you look through the entire suit, you'll see there's this sort of like rainbow quality in the entire suit. That's not oily fabric, that is moiré. As you start to move around here, you'll pick it up everywhere. But in that one spot on the side of her boob on the left, that's exact, That's where you pick it up more so than any place. So, And this is color moiré. It is much easier to fix because I do, it hasn't introduced a new pattern for me. It's a little bit, I mean, the sort of the target feel of it. So everybody's got this image up and can see what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so the way we're, this is how you fix it, the easy way to fix it. Go ahead and uh, make a copy of your file. So Command J, uh, and then we're gonna go up to the filter menu, down to blur, do not make a smart object out of this, we don't need to. Uh, anyway, up to the filter menu, down to blur, and down to Gaussian blur. And you need to hit this thing hard enough to get rid of that. Now I came in with a more uh, radius of four pixels on mine. I can still see the color and I can still see the target. So I'm just going to start using, uh, I just start to drag this up and I wanna keep going until I blur it and get rid of all of the color and get rid of all of that pattern part as well. So by the time I get up to like around a 19, I'm gonna go back down to a 16. You don't wanna go any higher than you need to go, but at 16 pixel radius, I can still see the target area. So I'm gonna go up to like a 20. That seems to be get rid of it for me. So I'm gonna just type in 20. So I've got the exact number in case you guys care about that. And I'm gonna go ahead and say okay to that. So that got rid of the more ray. You just double click on the hand and tell your client, this is your file. No, just kidding. You then need to change the blending mode of this second layer from normal down to color. And then if you zoom into that same area, you can see that the moiré is gone. So you can turn it on and off and you can see it actually gets rid of it. But look what else has happened. Look at the, um, she's got a whole, uh, like a glow around her arm. There's a halo going around her arm. So what we've done is we've actually mixed this color together to the point that it, you no longer have a discrete color left in there. Uh, and because we're using a color blending mode, it recolors it. But this is actually happening all over the entire image. So it's happening to her skin, it's happening to her hair, it's happening to everything. So to fix that part, turn off the eyeball for the layer that you use to get rid of that. Zip back out, grab your quick selection tool. And Make sure that your visible background layer is the one that is selected and click and we are just going to select her swimsuit. I'm going to zip in, hold down the option key to refine that selection just a little bit to get it off of her arm. And yeah, and we're close enough in this guys. You don't need to, I mean, we all know that we can go in and refine selections. I'm going to do her other shoulder just really quick. Uh, and then come back to your layer number one the one that we used that we blurred to remove the color and simply add this as a layer mask and now you have the best of both you've actually removed the color moiré but you don't have that uh, color fringing that's happening on her arm at all make sense to everyone yeah all right you can close that up you don't need to save that Um, let's go to still in session 10, I believe. Yep. Uh, inside session 10, there is a file called, hopefully it's in yours as well. Yeah, there's a skin as retouch version three, if you could open that up. Don't you guys wish you knew that had existed all along? Just kidding. So this is a somewhat retouched version of it, but uh, I mean, it's not complete, but it's close enough. It's not the original. So people talk about having or wanting to get shine in things. I tend to think of it instead of like wanting to get shine, really, what I really think more of is contrast. And so how would you guys make this image more contrasty? 
How would you bump the contrast in this image? What would you do? There's a million things, right? There's a contrast adjustment layer that you could run. Most people will actually just add an S curve on this. So if you come down to your adjustment layer, click on it and add a curve. In your properties panel, simply grab, I'm gonna go in at, they call, okay, so the areas that you're looking at on this graph right here would be called, this would be your, down at the very bottom would be your shadows. Up in the first intersection right here is called your three quarter tones. The next right in the middle are your mid-tones. The, then the quarter at the very top would be your quarter tones. I take it back, that's just the opposite, three quarters and quarter, and then highlights are up at the very top. So I'm gonna grab something right down at my quarter tone part, and I'm gonna click and pull down. It makes my darks a little bit darker. And then I'm gonna go to the three quarter tone mark and click and push it up. And you can see, I'm making my shadow areas darker. I'm making my highlights lighter. My mid-tones are pretty much unchanged. They're still right going right through the middle. So my mid-tones haven't been really affected here, but it changes the tone. And that's how people would actually add contrast to this. Personally, I don't think this looks good. So I'm gonna show you a better way to do contrast. Now, I've had people, uh, again, I always show this using uh, fashion, that kind of image, but I think I told you, I showed you some pictures of it. There was a grad student who was in this class who was a landscape photographer. Um, and once he saw this is the only way he builds contrast in his landscape photographs. I've had food people, this is the only way they build food. So um, I'm gonna show you a better way that I think of to do contrast um, that works much, much, well, it's just a better way of doing it. To do that, if you come over to your channels palette and hover over the um, uh, uh, icon of the RGB channel, Hold down your command key and click, it will actually load. And what has it loaded? I got a bunch of marching ants. It's loaded the luminosity of my image. So if you save this, come up to the, uh, sele uh, up to the yeah, the select menu, down to save selection. Um, and I'm just gonna call it luminosity. When we look at it, you'll see that that's what it is. And I'm gonna say okay to that, Command D to deselect, and then I'm gonna go look at it. And if you go down to the very bottom of your channel's palette, basically it's a black and white image. But if we think about this as a selection, if we were to load this again, are all areas of this image equally selected? No. The areas of the image that are lighter are more selected, and the images, areas of the image that are darker are less selected. It's the same thing. Masking, selections, they're interchangeable when it comes to that. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay, you can throw this guy away. It's, 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 it served its purpose. Go back up to the RGB guy again, hover over the thumbnail, hold down the command key, and click. What I have essentially loaded is the luminosity, but the highlights are considerably more selected than are the uh, uh, quarter tones and the, and the shadows. I'm gonna jump this to its own layer, Command J. If you turn off the background layer now, you will see this is what I've just done. I loaded the highlights of this image, and then I just copied them from a copy of the full Tonal Rain image and this is what I end up with. And you can see that the areas of the shirt, which are white, are almost fully selected. The areas of her skin are somewhat selected. The shadow underneath her chin is not selected at all. The nostrils, the uh, dark parts of her nostrils are not selected at all. The black irises of her eyes are not selected at all. Her eyebrows are less selected. So basically these are my highlights. Does that make sense, everyone? So I'm going to double click on that layer one and that's what I'm going to call it, highlights. And say okay. I'm going to turn off that eyeball and I'm going to go back down to my uh, background layer. I'm going to make it active and I'm going to turn its eyeball on. I need to get the shadows now. How would you do that? We don't have enough time for this so I'm just going to show you. Hover over the thumbnail of the RGB guy again. Hold down the command key and click. What have we just loaded? I'm sorry? I haven't inverted it yet, so what have I just loaded? 
I've just loaded the highlights. So now I'm going to invert it up to the select menu down to inverse. Again, you're not inverting the image. You are inverting the selection. <clears throat> With this now inverted, sorry. Um, this now should be my shadows. Again, I've got my background layer down at the very bottom. Command J to copy that. Turn off the eyeball at the bottom and you can now see this is the shadows. You can see none of the white shirt is selected. That's all completely transparent. A little bit of her skin is selected, but her the blackness of her the black the you know the black pupil of her eyes is fully selected. The nostrils are more selected. The shadow underneath her chin is more selected. So this is basically the shadows of my image. And so I'm going to double click on that and rename that shadows. So we have talked about blending modes to death in this class without ever really getting deeply into blending modes, but we are going to leverage two more blending modes here. I've showed you guys both quick shortcuts for how to dodge and burn using screen and multiply. We're going to do the very same thing here. So I'm going to, with my shadows selected, I'm going to leave my highlights off right now. It doesn't really matter. Actually, you can turn everybody on. It, you'll, see, you'll see the impact of it all. So go ahead and turn all the eyeballs on. But I've got my shadows layer selected, and I'm going to change its blending mode from normal down to multiply. And you can see it makes everything darker. Then I'm going to go to my highlights and I'm going to click on that and change its blending mode from normal down to screen. It makes them lighter. So what I've now done is I've taken two layers, but they have been split by tonality. Only the shadows are being made darker. None of my highlights are being made darker. Only the highlights are being made lighter. It's not making any of the shadows lighter. And this is a way to build contrast in here. Now, <clears throat> There's no hardcore rule about this, but there is a generalization about this. And the generalization is, is that the correction that we've made in the shadows is probably too strong. And the way, the figure that I always use it, it's twice as strong as the, the highlights should be twice as strong as the shadows. So you can use opacity to actually shift that. So I'm going to select the shadows and I'm simply going to drop the opacity down to 50%. Now, this is the ratio that I find, again, it's not a hardcore thing. There are times when I'm working on this image, I'll kill the shadows altogether. If I've already got really dark shadows, whatever, it pushes them down too hard. But realize that this is all a very flexible thing, right? But now, if you feel like this is a good thing, we've got the ratio, but wouldn't it be nice if we could really then see this across the entire range of additional contrast or not? To do that, select your highlights as well as the shadows. So I've got shadows are selected, highlights are selected. You want to put this into its own group. So click on the drop down menu. Somebody called this a hamburger the other day. Does that make sense? I mean, I get the idea. A hamburger? It never struck me that way, but I, anyway, so regardless, click on that and come over to new group from layers and simply call it contrast. And say OK. So now you've got a group that you can turn on and off, but this group also has opacity. So inside of the group, I've got my relationship of highlights to shadows double the highlights to the shadows. But now I can simply use my uh, uh, opacity for everything. So instead of going, oh, you need to drop the highlight opacity and then you need to go down and do the shadow opacity. You know, I mean, instead of doing it, this will do them effectively as one single group, as one adjustment. Uh, and then you can turn this on and off, but you will not get a better way to control contrast than this. Make sense? And I'm telling you right now, I don't care what you shoot. If you need contrast, this is how you do it. Food, landscapes, cars, sailboats, you name it. Are we good on this part? All right, you can close this guy. Oh, wait, leave this guy open for one second. If you close it up, open it back up again. <clears throat> Selective sharpening. So. I'm going to go back down to my background layer again. Actually, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to leave my contrast group at like 60%. 
and let's say, okay, I wanna finally finalize my file. I want this to get this ready for output. What is the final thing that you do for output? Sharpening, right? So that's what I'm gonna do here. So I'm going to make a copy of this all together because if we were trying to sharpen this right now, would you be sharpening the contrast layer? Would you be sharpening the layer underneath it? You'd have to sharpen everything. So it's just easier to combine them all into one. So make sure you got the contrast group is selected. Hold down the command option, shift and hit the letter E. It will make a merge stamp version of this. I'm gonna rename this sharpen and say okay to that. And then I'm gonna to try to sharpen this thing. So to start with though, <clears throat> I want to sharpen certain things, but not everything. This is a mistake a lot of people make in here. I've gone to all of this work to actually make this image, uh, the skin on this girl smooth. And now I'm going to turn right around and sharpen it up again. Why would I do that? However, I to go to print, I want her hair to be sharp. I want her eyes to be sharp. I want her mouth to be, her lips to be sharp, her nostrils. Uh, the features, I want those to be sharp. So we are going to make a selection of just her skin. To do that, come up to the select menu, down to color range. And if you want your screen to work the way mine does, I always keep my selection preview as grayscale. So instead of none, which allows you to see the image, click on grayscale, the one that's right underneath it. That way your image becomes a large version of the small preview. With the eyedropper selected, I'm just gonna click somewhere where I know there's skin. So I just clicked right in the middle of this image and I know that that's where her skin is. I've got a huge fuzziness on mine, so I'm going to grab my fuzziness and drag it down. Again, what fuzzy does, it just expands the tone. So I clicked on a spot on her face and it said, okay, I'm gonna pick that spot for you. But then your fuzziness slider says, okay, and I want you to pick 145 tones lighter than that and 145 tones darker than that. And that's why my image looked like it was completely selected. But as I start to bring this down and I'm gonna actually continue to drag it down pretty good <coughs> because I'm gonna go around to 35 on mine. When I selected that, when I made that selection, it was probably somewhere right around her cheek. So it's, it's sort of like where the, um, uh, yeah, just kind of in the, uh, between her, on the right side between her mouth and, and about a third of the way up towards her eye. That was roughly the area that I selected. But you'll notice if there's an area that's uh, much darker, it's the area where a lot of that retouching has happened. If I click on that highlight right there, it makes a different selection for me. It gets rid of the original selection and it makes a new one here. And that's not what I want. I want to actually build this selection. So to do that, you change eyedroppers. Instead of just this single eyedropper at the beginning that works like all the selection tools do, go to the one next to it, the one that's got the plus. And now with this, what'll happen is, it will not lose my first selection. It will allow me to actually click and build this selection. And I can continue to click on the areas. You can not only click you can actually click and drag across areas and it actually just builds more here. And so now I've got a rough, decent outline of her face, of, of her skin at selection. It's not perfect. I'm gonna tweak it though. For the work that we need to actually use with this, we're not gonna use this to knock anything out. We're strictly gonna use this to restrict where our sharpening goes. So this is the way mine looks and I'm gonna simply say okay to this. You get the marching ants, you need to save this selection. So I'm gonna go up to the select menu, down to save selection, and I'm gonna call this skin, and say okay to that. Command D to deselect, and then I'm gonna go at the very bottom of my uh, uh, channels palette um, and click on skin. And I'm going to now modify this. This would be a great time to get your tablet out and working. Okay, so we need to clean this up a little bit and you can be pretty down and dirty about this. So I'm gonna hit the B key to get a brush. I'm gonna make my brush, I'm gonna keep some pretty good control in it. So I'm gonna bump its hardness up to around 50, 60, somewhere in there. You don't wanna make it completely hard. You don't wanna make it completely soft. You want a little bit more control. Uh, I'm gonna leave my blending mode as normal, opacity at 100% and flow at 100%. Hit the D key to make sure your foreground and background colors are at their default. And then anything on this that you see that you, uh, that you would consider to be skin, you wanna actually clean it up with that brush. 
So stay away from her nostrils, but go after all the stuff that's under her eyes, the stuff that's on her cheeks. Do not do the shadow that's underneath her. Although you could do the shadow. Actually, go ahead and do the shadow underneath because that's also skin. And then again, just run down the shirt. You don't need to be perfect about this. If something screws up, don't worry about it. Every now and then you should get into the habit of lifting your brush up off of your uh, tablet. And the reason I do that is that if you do all of this work in one stroke and you make a mistake at the very end and you have to do Command Z to undo it, you have to start all over again. For me right now, the work that I've done so far is great. So if I make some screw up like I just did right there, Command Z doesn't do undo all the work that I've done. So anyway, I'm going to go in and clean in the rest of this up. Stay away from her hair, stay away from her eyebrows. If we miss something in here, it's not gonna be the end of the world. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm gonna hit the X key to get black as my foreground color, <clears throat> make my brush slightly smaller, and I'm going to go ahead and fill in all of her eyes. I'm gonna make it even smaller still and go after her eyebrows, her other eye. I'm gonna do all of her hair. There's a space of skin showing in between two locks of hair. There's no reason to include that. Uh, but again, I wouldn't spend ages working trying to perfect that. Uh, and then all of the rest of this uh, are just around her face. You don't need to paint everything all the way out. You just need to get this stuff that's right around her face. I'm gonna make my brush a little bit bigger. And I'm gonna go on the other side as well. So basically now I've got uh, uh, everything that's right around her face is pretty close. So look up at my screen really quickly just so I can show you this. Oh, wait, I need to do her lips. Her lips and her teeth need to be <clears throat> completely black. And there's some stuff right around her mouth. I'm going to hit the X key again just to clean up the skin that's right around her mouth. All right, I'm gonna double click on the hand. And then everybody watch, oh, sorry, there's still one spot up at the top I didn't see. Okay, so this is gonna be my next trick, the L key to get the lasso tool. Stay really close to that edge, so I'm gonna stay in the area that I know I've already painted black. So I'm just gonna continue to work my way all the way around. and then back up through the hair and let go. So this is now a selection primarily of her face. I'm going to invert this selection. So right now, you'll notice I've only got marching ants around her face, but if I go up and do select and do an inverse, I've got now marching ants that go around everything. So it's selected everything outside of her face. So that's what I'm gonna go for right here. I'm probably gonna lose that part of her hair right there though. So. I'm going to hold down my option key and get rid of this part. And then I'm just going to fill this with black. Black is my background color. Command delete will fill that. It's just easier than painting it. Command D. So basically now I've got just her skin is white. Everything else is black. Did that work for everybody? However, if I use this mask on a sharpening routine, will it hide the sharpening from the skin or show it? You need to invert this entire thing, Command I. Now I've got black on her skin, which will protect this. So over to, we're gonna load this as a selection. <clears throat> uh, command click. Oh, I take that back. First off, let's take our sharpening layer and make it a smart object. So up to, so I've just selected my sharpen layer, up to um, smart ob, uh, layer smart objects, convert to smart object. Then I'm gonna command click to load my skin mask as a selection. I'm gonna put it on my sharpen layer. So I'm gonna just add this as a layer mask. And then I'm gonna whack the hell out of this. So make sure that you've got the pixel content of this selected up to the select menu. I'm sorry, the filter menu down to sharpen and we'll do unsharp mask because it's the one most people are familiar with. Unsharp mask 
and I'm gonna smack this hard. I'm gonna hit a radius of two pixels, and I'm gonna crank the amount all the way up to 500. And then I'm gonna zip in and take a look and see what I did. So you can see right now, if you use your preview on and off, that you have radically over sharpened the eyes, but you haven't touched the skin, which is exactly what you would wanna do. You need to be selective about your sharpening. But then you could say to yourself, well, God, yeah, Verser, but that just looks so crunchy. That's just so overdone. How do you judge sharpening anyone? All you people who print, you fucking have no idea how to sharpen? Or you don't care? Or you don't sharpen and you just end up with really mushy, unsharp, shitty prints? Yeah, why do you have to sharpen to print? Anybody have any idea? Well then let's think about the process. When you have ink spitting out of a gun onto a piece of paper, that paper absorbs the ink, right? Imagine a sponge with a drop of water landing on it. Does it stay as a perfect circle? No, it bleeds, it spreads. They call that dot gain in the professional printing industry and it happens no matter what. It happens worse with matte papers than it does glossy. That's why you actually sharpen your work destined to matte than you do for glossy because the dot gain is worse. So what you do is you over sharpen your image so that when it hits the paper and bleeds and makes it softer, they counteract each other. Your over sharpening is softened by the dot gain and you end up with the image that you want. So how does that mean how you judge it? The only way, if anybody tells you this any different, they're lying to you, walk away. The only way you will ever know is you have to do the print. There's no way to preview it. There's no way to guess about it. There's no way to do any of that shit. It doesn't happen that way. You've got to print it out. So in my case, I just say okay to this. I'm gonna say okay to this. I would pull a print and see. And then I look at the print and I say, oh my God, that's so over sharpened. I can't believe I did that. And then you feel like, oh, I've gotta go through the whole process again. You don't. Just drag your opacity of this top layer down to 50%. Now you've got half of the sharpening. Pull another print. Still too sharp. Pull this down to 25%. Do another one. That's how you sharpen. Make sense? All right. You know, I, I do that as an example just to like overshow it. I prefer to use opacity to lessen it. It's just people can you can start dicking around with it for so long. Um, if you hit it the same thing every single time, uh, you know, then at least it just it, it's a known. And you just again, it just it fewer variables. We good? Okay. I think now would be a good time for our second break. So I'm gonna call this 345, make this a hard 10, be back at 355, and we will, uh, we're winding this up and then we're gonna start working on compositing. <clears throat> it's a lot, so.